Section 13 of Coningsby or the New Generation by Benjamin Disraeli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 4, Chapter 3. In a green valley of Lancaster, contiguous to that district of factories on which we have already touched, a clear and powerful stream flows through a broad meadow land. Upon its margin, adorned rather than shadowed by some old elm trees, for they are too distant to serve except for ornament, rises a vast deep red brick pile, which, though formal and monotonous in its general character, is not without a certain beauty of proportion and an artist-like finish in its occasional masonry. The front, which is of great extent, and covered with many tiers of small windows, is flanked by two projecting wings in the same style, which form a large court, completed by a dwarf wall crowned with a light and rather elegant railing. In the centre, the principal entrance, a lofty portal of bold and beautiful design, surmounted by a statue of commerce. This building, not without a degree of dignity, is what is technically, and not very felicitously, called a mill, always translated by the French in their accounts of our manufacturing riots, Moulin, and which really was the principal factory of Oswald Millbank, the father of that youth whom we trust our readers have not quite forgotten. At some little distance, and rather withdrawn from the principal stream, were two other smaller structures of the same style. About a quarter of a mile further on appeared a village of not inconsiderable size, and remarkable from the neatness and even picturesque character of its architecture and the gay gardens that surrounded it. On a sunny knoll in the background rose a church in the best style of Christian architecture, and near it was a clerical residence and a schoolhouse of similar design. The village, too, could boast of another public building, an institute where there were a library and a lecture room, and a reading hall which any one might frequent at certain hours and under reasonable regulations. On the other side of the principal factory, but more remote, about half a mile up the valley, surrounded by beautiful meadows, and built on an agreeable and well-wooded elevation, was the mansion of the mill-owner, apparently a commodious and not inconsiderable dwelling-house, built in what is called a villa style, with a variety of gardens and conservatories. The atmosphere of this somewhat striking settlement was not disturbed and polluted by the dark vapour, which, to the shame of Manchester, still infests that great town, for Mr. Milbank, who liked nothing so much as an invention, unless it were an experiment, took care to consume his own smoke. The sun was declining when Coningsby arrived at Milbank, and the gratification which he experienced on first beholding it was not a little diminished when, on inquiring at the village, he was informed that the hour was past for seeing the works. Determined not to relinquish his purpose without a struggle, he repaired to the principal mill and entered the counting-house, which was situated in one of the wings of the building. "'Your pleasure, sir,' said one of three individuals, sitting on high stools behind a high desk. "'I wish, if possible, to see the works.' "'Quite impossible, sir.' And the clerk, withdrawing his glance, continued his writing. "'No admission without an order, and no admission with an order after two o'clock.' "'I am very unfortunate,' said Coningsby. "'Sorry for it, sir. Give me the ledger KX, will you, Mr. Benson?' "'I think Mr. Milbank would grant me permission,' said Coningsby. "'Very likely, sir, to-morrow. Mr. Milbank is there, sir, but very much engaged.' He pointed to an inner counting-house, and the glass doors permitted Coningsby to observe several individuals in close converse. "'Perhaps his son, Mr. Oswald Milbank, is here?' inquired Coningsby. "'Mr. Oswald is in Belgium,' said the clerk. "'Would you give a message to Mr. Milbank, and say that a friend of his son's at Eton is here, and only for a half-day, and wishes very much to see his works?' "'Can't possibly disturb Mr. Milbank now, sir, but if you like to sit down, you can wait and see him yourself.' Coningsby was content to sit down, though he grew very impatient at the end of a quarter of an hour. The ticking of the clock, the scratching of the pens of the three silent clerks, irritated him. At length voices were heard, doors opened, 
and the clerk said, Mr. Milbank is coming, sir, but nobody came. Voices became hushed, doors were shut, again nothing was heard save the ticking of the clock and the scratching of the pen. At length there was a general stir, and they all did come forth, Mr. Milbank among them, a well-proportioned, comely man, with a fair face inclining to ruddiness, a quick, glancing hazel eye, the whitest teeth, and short, curly chestnut hair, here and there slightly tinged with grey. It was a visage of energy and decision. He was about to pass through the counting-house with his companions, with whom his affairs were not concluded, when he observed Coningsby, who had risen. "'This gentleman wishes to see me?' he inquired of his clerk, who bowed assent. "'I shall be at your service, sir, the minute I have finished with these gentlemen.' "'The gentleman wishes to see the work, sir,' said the clerk. "'He can see the works at proper time,' said Mr. Milbank, somewhat pettishly. "'Tell him the regulations,' and he was about to go. "'I beg your pardon, sir,' said Coningsby, coming forward and with an air of earnestness and grace that arrested the step of the manufacturer. "'I am aware of the regulations, but would beg to be permitted to infringe them.' "'It cannot be, sir,' said Mr. Milbank, moving. I thought, sir, being here only for a day, and as a friend of your son. Mr. Milbank stopped, and said, Oh, a friend of Oswald's, eh? What? At Eton? Yes, sir, at Eton, and I hope perhaps to have found him here. I am very much engaged, sir, at this moment, said Mr. Milbank. I am sorry I cannot pay you any personal attention, but my clerk will show you everything. Mr. Benson, let this gentleman see everything and he withdrew. "'Be pleased to write your name here, sir,' said Mr. Benson, opening a book, and our friend wrote his name and the date of his visit to Millbank. Harry Coningsby, September 2nd, 1836. Coningsby beheld in this great factory the last and most refined inventions of mechanical genius. The building had been fitted up by a capitalist as anxious to raise a monument of the skill and power of his order as to obtain a return for the great investment. "'It is the glory of Lancashire!' exclaimed the enthusiastic Mr. Benson. The clerk spoke freely of his master, whom he evidently idolized, and his great achievements, and Coningsby encouraged him. He detailed to Coningsby the plans which Mr. Milbank had pursued, both for the moral and physical well-being of his people, how he had built churches and schools and institutes, houses and cottages on a new system of ventilation, how he had allotted gardens, established singing classes. "'Here is Mr. Milbank,' continued the clerk, as he and Coningsby, quitting the factory, re-entered the court. Mr. Milbank was approaching the factory and the moment that he observed them he quickened his pace. Mr. Coningsby, he said, when he reached them. His countenance was rather disturbed, and his voice a little trembled, and he looked on our friend with a glance scrutinizing and serious. Coningsby bowed. "'I am sorry that you should have been received at this place with so little ceremony, sir,' said Mr. Milbank, "'but had your name been mentioned you would have found it cherished here.' He nodded to the clerk, who disappeared. Coningsby began to talk about the wonders of the factory, but Mr. Milbank recurred to other thoughts that were passing in his mind. He spoke of his son, he expressed a kind reproach that Coningsby should have thought of visiting this part of the world without giving them some notice of his intention that he might have been their guest, that Oswald might have been there to receive him, and that they might have made arrangements that he should see everything and in the best manner. In short, that they might all have shown, however slightly, the deep sense of their obligations to him. "'My visit to Manchester, which led to this, was quite accidental,' said Coningsby. "'I am bound for the other division of the county to pay a visit to my grandfather, Lord Monmouth, but an irresistible desire came over me during my journey to view this famous district of industry. It is some days since I ought to have found myself at Coningsby, and this is the reason why I am so pressed. A cloud passed over the countenance of Milbank, as the name of Lord Monmouth was mentioned, but he said nothing. Turning towards Coningsby, with an air of kindness, At least, said he, let not Oswald hear that you did not taste our salt. 
Pray dine with me to-day. There is yet an hour to dinner. And as you have seen the factory, suppose we stroll together through the village. End of chapter 3 Book 4, Chapter 4 The village clock struck five as Mr. Milbank and his guest entered the gardens of his mansion. Coningsby lingered a moment to admire the beauty and gay profusion of the flowers. "'Your situation,' said Coningsby, looking up the green and silent valley, "'is absolutely poetic.' "'I sometimes try to fancy,' said Mr. Milbank, with a rather fierce smile, "'that I am in the new world.' They entered the house, a capacious and classic hall, at the end a staircase in the Italian fashion. As they approached it, the sweetest and the clearest voice exclaimed from above, Papa, papa! And instantly a young girl came bounding down the stairs, but suddenly seeing a stranger with her father, she stopped upon the landing place, and was evidently on the point of as rapidly retreating as she had advanced when Mr. Milbank waved his hand to her and begged her to descend. She came down slowly. As she approached them, her father said, "'A friend you have often heard of, Edith. This is Mr. Coningsby.' She started, blushed very much, and then, with a trembling and uncertain gait, advanced, put forth her hand with a wild, unstudied grace, and said in a tone of sensibility, "'How often have we all wished to see and to thank you?' This daughter of his host was of tender years. Apparently she could scarcely have counted sixteen summers. She was delicate and fragile, but as she raised her still blushing visage to her father's guest, Coningsby felt that he had never beheld a countenance of such striking and such peculiar beauty. "'My only daughter, Mr. Coningsby, Edith, a Saxon name, for she is the daughter of a Saxon.' But the beauty of the countenance was not the beauty of the Saxons. It was a radiant face, one of those that seemed to have been touched in their cradle by a sunbeam, and to have retained all their brilliancy and suffused and mantling lustre. One marks sometimes such faces, diaphanous with delicate splendour, in the southern regions of France. Her eye, too, was the rare eye of Aquitaine, soft and long, with lashes drooping over the cheek, dark as her clustering ringlets. They entered the drawing-room. "'Mr. Coningsby,' said Milbank to his daughter, "'is in this part of the world only for a few hours, or I am sure he would become our guest. He has, however, promised to stay with us now and dine.' "'If Miss Milbank will pardon this dress,' said Coningsby, bowing an apology for his inevitable frock and boots, the maiden raised her eyes and bent her head. The hour of dinner was at hand. Milbank offered to show Coningsby to his dressing-room. He was absent but a few minutes. When he returned, he found Miss Milbank alone. He came somewhat suddenly into the room. She was playing with her dog, but ceased the moment she observed Coningsby. Coningsby, who since his practice with Lady Everingham flattered himself that he had advanced in small talk, and was not sorry that he had now an opportunity of proving his prowess, made some lively observations about pets and the breeds of lap-dogs, but he was not fortunate in extracting a response or exciting a repartee. He began then on the beauty of Millbank, which he would on no account have avoided seeing, and inquired when she had last heard of her brother. The young lady, apparently much distressed, was murmuring something about Antwerp, when the entrance of her father relieved her from her embarrassment. Dinner being announced, Coningsby offered his arm to his fair companion, who took it with her eyes fixed on the ground. "'You are very fond, I see, of flowers,' said Coningsby, as they moved along, and the young lady said, "'Yes.' The dinner was plain, but perfect of its kind. The young hostess seemed to perform her office with a certain degree of desperate determination. She looked at a chicken, and then at Coningsby, and murmured something which he understood. Sometimes she informed herself of his tastes or necessities in more detail by the medium of her father, whom she treated as a sort of dragoman, in this way. Would not Mr. Coningsby, papa, take this or that, or do so-and-so? Coningsby was always careful to reply in a direct manner, without the agency of the interpreter, but he did not advance. 
even a petition for the great honour of taking a glass of sherry with her only induced the beautiful face to bow and yet when she had first seen him she had addressed him even with emotion what could it be he felt less confidence in his increased power of conversation why theresa sydney was scarcely a year older than miss millbank and though she did not certainly originate like lady everingham he got on with her perfectly well mr millbank did not seem to be conscious of his daughter's silence at any rate he attempted to compensate for it he talked fluently and well on all subjects his opinions seemed to be decided and his language was precise he was really interested in what coningsby had seen and what he had felt and this sympathy divested his manner of the disagreeable effect that accompanies a tone inclined to be dictatorial more than once coningsby observed the silent daughter listening with extreme attention to the conversation of himself and her father the dessert was remarkable millbank was proud of his fruit a bland expression of self-complacency spread over his features as he surveyed his grapes his peaches his figs these grapes have gained a medal he told coningsby those too are prize peaches i have not yet been so successful with my figs these however promise and perhaps this year i may be more fortunate what would your brother and myself have given for such a dessert at eton said coningsby to miss millbank wishing to say something and something too that might interest her she seemed infinitely distressed and yet this time would speak let me give you some he caught by chance her glance immediately withdrawn yet it was a glance not only of beauty but of feeling and thought she added in a hushed and hurried tone dividing very nervously some grapes i hardly know whether oswald will be most pleased or grieved when he hears that you have been here and why grieved said coningsby that he should not have been here to welcome you and that your stay is for so brief a time it seems so strange that after having talked of you for years we should see you only for hours i hope i may return said coningsby and that millbank may be here to welcome me but i hope i may be permitted to return even if he is not but there was no reply and soon after mr millbank talking of the american market and coningsby helping himself to a glass of claret the daughter of the saxon looking at her father rose and left the room so suddenly and so quickly that coningsby could scarcely gain the door yes said millbank filling his glass and pursuing some previous observations all that we want in this country is to be masters of our own industry but saxon industry and norman manners never will agree and some day mr coningsby you will find that out but what do you mean by norman manners inquired coningsby did you ever hear of the forest of rossendale said millbank if you were staying here you should visit the district it is an area of twenty-four square miles it was disforested in the early part of the sixteenth century possessing at the time eighty inhabitants its rental in james the first's time was one hundred and twenty pounds when the woollen manufacturer was introduced into the north the shuttle competed with the plough in rossendale and about forty years ago we sent them the jenny the eighty souls are now increased to upwards of eighty thousand and the rental of the forest by the last county assessment amounts to more than fifty thousand pounds forty one thousand per cent on the value in the reign of james the first now i call that an instance of saxon industry competing successfully with norman manners exactly said coningsby but those manners are gone from rossendale said millbank with a grim smile but not from england where do you meet them meet them in every place at every hour and feel them too in every transaction of life i know sir from your son said coningsby inquiringly that you are opposed to an aristocracy no i am not i am for an aristocracy but a real one a natural one but sir is not the aristocracy of england said coningsby a real one you do not confound our peerage for example with the degraded patricians of the continent hm said millbank 
I do not understand how an aristocracy can exist unless it be distinguished by some quality which no other class of the community possesses. Distinction is the basis of aristocracy. If you permit only one class of the population, for example, to bear arms, they are an aristocracy, not one much to my taste, but still a great fact. That, however, is not the characteristic of the English peerage. I have yet to learn that they are richer than we are, better informed, wiser, or more distinguished for public or private virtue. Is it not monstrous, then, that a very small number of men, several of whom take the titles of duke and earl from towns in this very neighbourhood, towns which they never saw, which never heard of them, which they did not form or build or establish, I say, is it not monstrous that individuals so circumstanced should be invested with the highest of conceivable privileges, the privilege of making laws? Dukes and earls, indeed! I say there is nothing in a masquerade more ridiculous. But do you not argue from an exception, sir, said Coningsby? The question is whether a preponderance of the aristocratic principle in a political constitution be, as I believe, conducive to the stability and permanent power of a state and whether the peerage, as established in England, generally tends to that end? We must not forget in such an estimate the influence which in this country is exercised over opinion by ancient lineage. Ancient lineage, said Mr. Milbank, I never heard of a peer with an ancient lineage. The real old families of this country are to be found among the peasantry. The gentry, too, may lay some claim to old blood. I can point you out Saxon families in this county who can trace their pedigrees beyond the conquest. I know of some Norman gentlemen whose fathers undoubtedly came over with the conqueror. But a peer with an ancient lineage is to me quite a novelty. No, no, the thirty years of the Wars of the Roses freed us from those gentlemen, I take it, after the Battle of Tewkesbury, a Norman baron was almost as rare a being in England as a wolf is now. I have always understood, said Coningsby, that our peerage was the finest in Europe. From themselves, said Milbank, and the heralds they pay to paint their carriages. But I go to facts. When Henry the Seventh called his first Parliament, there were only twenty-nine temporal peers to be found, and even some of them took their seats illegally, for they had been attainted. Of those twenty-nine, not five remain and they, as the Howards, for instance, are not Norman nobility. We owe the English peerage to three sources, the spoliation of the church, the open and flagrant sale of its honours by the elder Stuarts, and the borough-mongering of our own times. Those are the three main sources of the existing peerage of England, and, in my opinion, disgraceful ones. But I must apologise for my frankness in thus speaking to an aristocrat. Oh, by no means, sir, I like discussion. Your son and myself at Eton have had some encounters of this kind before. But if your view of the case be correct, added Coningsby, smiling, you cannot, at any rate, accuse our present peers of Norman manners. Yes, I do. They adopted Norman manners while they usurped Norman titles. They have neither the right of the Normans, nor do they fulfil the duty of the Normans. They did not conquer the land, and they do not defend it. "'And where will you find your natural aristocracy?' asked Coningsby. "'Among those men whom a nation recognises as the most eminent for virtue, talents, and property, and, if you please, birth and standing in the land. They guide opinion, and therefore they govern. I am no leveller. I look upon an artificial equality as equally pernicious with a factitious aristocracy, both depressing the energies and checking the enterprise of a nation. I like man to be free, really free, free in his industry as well as his body. What is the use of habeas corpus if a man may not use his hands when he is out of prison? But it appears to me you have in great measure this natural aristocracy in England. Ah, to be sure. If we had not, where should we be? It is the counteracting power that saves us, the disturbing cause in the calculations of short-sighted selfishness. I say it now, and I have said it a hundred times, the House of Commons is a more aristocratic body than the House of Lords. 
the fact is a great peer would be a greater man now in the house of commons than in the house of lords nobody wants a second chamber except a few disreputable individuals it is a valuable institution for any member of it who has no distinction neither character talents nor estate but a peer who possesses all or any of these great qualifications would find himself an immeasurably more important personage in what by way of jest they call the lower house is not the revising wisdom of a senate a salutary check on the precipitation of a popular assembly why should a popular assembly elected by the flower of a nation be precipitate if precipitate what senate could stay an assembly so chosen no 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 the thing has been tried over and over again the idea of restraining the powerful by the weak is an absurdity the question is settled if we wanted a fresh illustration we need only look to the present state of our own house of lords it originates nothing it has in fact announced itself as a mere court of registration of the decrees of your house of commons and if by any chance it ventures to alter some miserable detail in a clause of a bill that excites public interest what a clatter through the country at conservative banquets got up by the rural attorneys about the power authority and independence of the house of lords nine times nine and one cheer more no sir you may make aristocracies by laws you can only maintain them by manners the manners of england preserve it from its laws and they have substituted for our formal aristocracy an essential aristocracy the government of those who are distinguished by their fellow citizens but then it would appear said coningsby that the remedial action of our manners has removed all the political and social evils of which you complain they have created a power that may remove them a power that has the capacity to remove them but in a great measure they still exist and must exist yet i fear for a long time the growth of our civilization has ever been as slow as our oaks but this tardy development is preferable to the temporary expansion of the gourd the future seems to me sometimes a dark cloud not to me said mr millbank i am sanguine i am the disciple of progress but i have cause for my faith i have witnessed advance my father has often told me that in his early days the displeasure of a peer of england was like a sentence of death to a man why was it esteemed a great concession to public opinion so late as the reign of george the second that lord farage should be executed for murder the king of a new dynasty who wished to be popular with the people insisted on it and even then he was hanged with a silken cord at any rate we may defend ourselves now continued mr millbank and perhaps do something more i defy any peer to crush me though there is one who would be very glad to do it no more of that i am very happy to see you at millbank very happy to make your acquaintance he continued with some emotion and not merely because you are my son's friend and more than friend the walls of the dining-room were covered with pictures of great merit all of the modern english school mr millbank understood no other he was wont to say and he found that many of his friends who did bought a great many pleasing pictures that were copies and many originals that were very displeasing he loved a fine free landscape by lee that gave him the broad plains the green lanes and running streams of his own land a group of animals by landseer as full of speech and sentiment as if they were designed by aesop above all he delighted in the household humour and homely pathos of wilkie and if a higher tone of imagination pleased him he could gratify it without difficulty among his favourite masters he possessed some specimens of etty worthy of venice when it was alive he could muse amid the fair twilight ruins of ancient cities raised by the magic pencil of danby or accompany a group of fair neapolitans to a festival by the genial aid of ewins opposite coningsby was a portrait which had greatly attracted his attention during the whole dinner it represented a woman young and of a rare beauty the costume was of that classical character prevalent in this country before the general peace a blue ribbon bound together as a fillet her clustering chestnut curls 
The face was looking out of the canvas, and Coningsby never raised his eyes without catching its glance of blended vivacity and tenderness. There are moments when our sensibility is affected by circumstances of a trivial character. It seems a fantastic emotion, but the gaze of this picture disturbed the serenity of Coningsby. He endeavoured sometimes to avoid looking at it, but it irresistibly attracted him. More than once during dinner he longed to inquire whom it represented, but it is a delicate subject to ask questions about portraits, and he refrained. Still, when he was rising to leave the room, the impulse was irresistible. He said to Mr. Milbank, "'By whom is that portrait, sir?' The countenance of Milbank became disturbed. It was not an expression of tender reminiscence that fell upon his features. On the contrary, the expression was agitated, almost angry. "'Oh, that is by a country artist,' he said, "'of whom you have never heard,' and moved away. They found Miss Milbank in the drawing-room. She was sitting at a round table covered with working materials, apparently dressing a doll. "'Nay,' thought Coningsby, "'she must be too old for that.' He addressed her, and seated himself by her side. There were several dolls on the table, but he discovered on examination that they were pincushions, and elicited with some difficulty that they were making for a fancy fair about to be held in aid of that excellent institution, the Manchester Athenaeum. Then the father came up and said, "'My child, let us have some tea,' and she rose and seated herself at the tea-table. Coningsby also quitted his seat and surveyed the apartment." There were several musical instruments. Among others he observed a guitar, not such an instrument as one buys in a music shop, but such an one as tinkles at Seville, a genuine Spanish guitar. Coningsby repaired to the tea-table. "'I'm glad that you are fond of music, Miss Milbank.' A blush and a bow. "'I hope after tea you will be so kind as to touch the guitar.' Signals of great distress. "'Were you ever at Birmingham?' Yes, a sigh. What a splendid music hall! They should build one at Manchester. They ought, in a whisper. The tea tray was removed. Coningsby was conversing with Mr. Milbank, who was asking him questions about his son what he thought of Oxford, what he thought of Oriel, should himself have preferred Cambridge, but had consulted a friend, an Oriel man, who had a great opinion of Oriel, and Oswald's name had been entered some years back. He rather regretted it now, but the thing was done. Coningsby, remembering the promise of the guitar, turned round to claim its fulfilment, but the singer had made her escape. Time elapsed, and no Miss Milbank reappeared. Coningsby looked at his watch. He had to go three miles to the train, which started, as his friend of the previous night would phrase it, at 9.45. "'I should be happy if you remained with us,' said Mr. Milbank. But as you say, it is out of your power. In this age of punctual travelling, a host is bound to speed the parting guest. The carriage is ready for you. Farewell, then, sir. You must make my adieus to Miss Milbank, and accept my thanks for your great kindness. Farewell, Mr. Coningsby, said his host, taking his hand, which he retained for a moment, as if he would say more. Then leaving it, he repeated with a somewhat wandering air, and in a voice of emotion, farewell, farewell, Mr. Coningsby. End of chapter 4